Hi, kids. Welcome to I Love Toy Trains Ticket to Ride. I'm Jeff, and this is our 16th I Love Toy Trains show since the first was made 20 years ago. Guess what? We have another great show for you. We'll visit a strange town called Backwardsville where weird things happen. We'll see diesels and steam locomotives. Oh no! Some new oh no's. Learn about the 999 steamer and the trip lights. And we'll visit Tall Tree, an outdoor G gauge layout where we'll see lots of trains in action and learn a little history. We've got a lot of track to cover, so let's get started. As always, we open with a song. Rolling through the countryside, watching those towns go passing by on a warm and sunny day. Steaming on down the railroad track with the rumbling cars and the clickety clack, meeting folks along the way. Sometimes it's like living in a dream. Past the rolling hills and winding streams Upon this train I've got a ticket to ride upon this train I've got a ticket to ride upon this train I've got a ticket to ride upon this train Feel the sway of the railroad cars Underneath the moon and stars As night turns into Sun in a misty sky, whistle weeping a fond goodbye, bringing me back from far away. Been so long a traveling on my own. Now it's time for me to head on home. Upon this train, I've got a ticket to ride upon this train. I've got a ticket to ride upon this train. I've got a ticket to ride upon this train. It's Diesel Day at the Illinois Railway Museum in Union, Illinois, about 60 miles west of Chicago. The museum has a large collection of steam, electric, and diesel-powered locomotives. Today, a variety of diesels are brought out for visitors to see and hear in action. For anyone who loves trains, real or toy, the Illinois Railway Museum is a great place to visit you get to see beautiful pieces of railroad equipment up close. Here's a nice looking Milwaukee Road model H10-44 diesel built by Fairbanks Morse. This is a GP7 built by General Motors. GP stands for general purpose. The GP diesels were nicknamed Jeeps. Jeeps were very popular and were used by many railroads for hauling freight and yard switching. Here's another Jeep. This one is pulling a flat car and a crane car. This blue switcher is a Model S1 built by the American Locomotive Company, or ELCO for short. The gray switcher is an SW1 built by General Motors. General Motors locomotives were built in their Electromotive Division, which was located in LaGrange, Illinois.
Here's a General Motors SW7 switcher just painted in Burlington colors. These little switchers aren't as powerful as their big brothers, but they help by moving just one or two cars around in the yards. The Army Switcher is a 45-ton model built by General Electric. The small orange switcher is about the same length as an average automobile. We like where it's from, too. Now let's look at a few big diesels. This is a Wisconsin Central SD45. SD stands for Special Duty. Pay attention to the sign on the side. Here comes one of the best-selling diesels ever made the SD40-2. Railroads loved their power and reliability. General Motors built almost 4,000 SD40-2s between 1972 and 1989. The green and black Burlington Northern locomotive lashed up to the SD40-2 is a General Electric U30C. One of the most beautiful trains ever made is the Nebraska Zephyr. The Nebraska Zephyr is headed by an E5 model locomotive. The streamlined passenger cars are articulated, which means a single set of trucks is used to support the ends of two cars. The front of the E5 has a distinctive character with two big windows in the cab and a sloping nose and bright headlight in the center. An E-unit locomotive has six wheel trucks, and an F-unit has four wheel trucks. The Illinois Railway Museum has many E and F units. This is a Burlington Northern F9, which has an A and B locomotive. A locomotives have a cab for the engineer and crew to sit in and control the train. A B locomotive doesn't have a cab, and is controlled by the crew in the A locomotive. The B locomotive provides more power to pull longer trains. The F7 came before the F9. This is a Chicago and Northwestern F7. The F7s had less horsepower than the F9, but they looked the same. The F7 was a modified version of the F3. The F3 happens to be the favorite diesel of my old pal Vinny. Take it away, Vinny! Thanks, Jeff. I love seeing all those diesels. But do you know what my absolute favorite diesel is? The F3. I love the streamlined look and all those colorful paint schemes. Here, let me show you a few. Here's the red and white Texas Special. Gorgeous, isn't it? Between 1945 and 1949, almost 50 railroads bought F3 diesels from the Electromotive Division of General Motors. Looks good in blue and white, too. That's the Baltimore and Ohio. The New York Central ran F3s, too. They call this the lightning stripe paint scheme because the gray stripe looks like a bolt of lightning. The Southern Pacific ran an F3 along the coast between Los Angeles and San Francisco. They call this paint scheme the Black Widow. I think it's sharp. The St. Louis South Western Railway was nicknamed the Cotton Belt Line because they used F3s to take passengers to cotton producing states like Louisiana, Tennessee, and Texas. The Simpsons ride the Alaskan Railroad in their movie, but they should have used the right colors, blue and yellow. Those bright blue and yellow colors can be seen all around Alaska. I hope they all have good heaters. The red and silver Santa Fe is my second favorite paint scheme. They call it the war bonnet because it reminds people of the feathers and fancy hats Indians used to wear when they threw a party. My first favorite is the Golf Mobile in Ohio. I just love the red and maroon paint scheme, the gold striping and lettering. And you don't see many Golf Mobile and Ohio F3s. That means they're very rare. I wish I had matching passenger cars to go with them. Hey, what's your favorite?
Oh, no. Engine number 999 was built by the New York Central and Hudson River Railroad to head the Empire State Express passenger train, which made tracks around upstate New York. Here we see it passing Niagara Falls. That railroad eventually became the New York Central Railroad. The Niagara Falls are easily the most famous waterfalls in North America. In terms of water flowing over the edge, they rank number one in the world, with a whopping average of about 750,000 gallons per second, dropping 165 feet into the Niagara River below. The 999 was a beautiful locomotive. The pipes and trim were polished. The boiler, smokestack, domes, cab, and tender were painted black and Empire State Express was painted on both sides of the tender in large script lettering. The drive wheels were over seven feet tall and on May 10, 1893, the number 999 was the first machine on wheels to go over 100 miles per hour. Its top speed that day was 112.5 miles per hour. That set a new world speed record. They called her the Queen of Speed. Those who were there said the 999 roared through town, billowing smoke and kicking up a cloud of dust. The crowd cheered as the locomotive roared past. News of this great accomplishment was telegraphed to all parts of the world. The 999 was the star attraction at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893 and brought prestige and honor to the New York Central and Hudson River Railroad. The 999 pounded the rails until 1952, when it was retired. Ten years later, the New York Central donated the 999 to Chicago's Museum of Science and Industry, where today it occupies a place of honor near the front entrance. If they had a Hall of Fame for steam locomotives, the 999 would be a charter member.
We're at the Tall Tree Arboretum in Valparaiso, Indiana. What's an arboretum and why should we care? An arboretum is about trees and plants, and we should care because trees and plants are important to all of us. But trees and plants aren't the only reason we're here. We're also here because of trains. Tall Tree has two and a half acres dedicated to an outdoor G-gauge garden railway. The garden railway uses bridges, long straightaways, waterfalls, mountains made from real rock, live trees and plants, scratch-built scale models, people, and model trains to tell the story of one of man's greatest adventures and one of man's greatest achievements the building of the world's first transcontinental railroad. Tall Tree's team of landscape architects, model makers, model train experts, and bridge builders have created miniature vignettes depicting major events in our nation's history. Our story starts on a sunny summer day in Promontory Point, Utah. It's May 10th, 1869. Railroad tracks from the east connect with tracks from the west and, for the first time, iron rails span our nation. The last spike used to join the rails is a gold spike. America is changed forever. The railroads open the vast prairies to farming and raising livestock. People from all over the world come to America in the hope of finding a better life. Every 200 miles, steam locomotives need more water and coal to keep moving on down the track. In the 1870s, towns like this pop up wherever the railroads put up a water tower and coal bin. It isn't fancy. The streets are muddy when it rains and the folks use an outhouse for the toilet. You might see a cowboy lassoing a calf right in the middle of the main street. Towns grow as trains kept bringing more people and supplies like lumber and bricks. Settlers build houses, churches, and stores with large fake fronts to make their businesses seem more impressive. Children attend school in a one-room schoolhouse. Grades one through eight are in the same room. Look at Jimmy Hodges playing a trick on his younger brother, Billy. Jimmy puts a big rock on the low end of the teeter-totter. Now Billy is stuck in the air. Progress is slow, but it is being made. Stone and gravel cover the dirt streets, and the speed of trains goes from 15 miles per hour in 1856 to 50 miles per hour in 1880. Towns grow bigger as America expands westward. Better building materials are needed to build bigger buildings. This is a limestone quarry in southern Indiana. Architects love limestone because it doesn't rot, warp, peel, rust, shrink, crack, or slip off a wall. It just sits there. Railroads carry limestone to points all around the USA for the construction of classic buildings, some of which are still standing today. The Empire State Building in New York City and 35 of our state capitals use Indiana limestone. The five Great Lakes are key shipping routes. Chicago grows quickly on the shores of Lake Michigan and becomes the transportation center of the nation. Business booms as lumber, livestock, grain, and steel are sold to emerging markets all over the country. Then disaster. In 1871, the Chicago fire burns for three days and destroys the entire city. But as bad as that fire is, it opens the door to building new, better, and bigger buildings. Many of the new buildings use the limestone from southern Indiana. 
The new, bustling Chicago quickly becomes one of our biggest and most important cities. The barrels on the dock are an example of how much care and detail go into the vignettes. Each of those barrels are built from scratch and take model makers one and a half hours to make. The stockyards and most of the buildings are also scratch built. As the country booms, so does the demand for lumber. Loggers chop down trees in forests from Maine to Minnesota. The trees go to sawmills, are cut into boards, then are carried out west on flat cars pulled by a steam locomotive. Railroads also need wood for bridges, freight cars, fuel, and ties. By the 1870s, coal fuels America's growth. Coal burns more efficiently than wood at half the price. So coal replaces wood as the fuel of choice for steam locomotives. Steam-powered factories also use coal. Miners work deep inside coal-rich mountains to break out the coal and send it out to the waiting rail cars. The steel industry uses coke, which is made from coal. Coal is dumped through the opening at the top of these coke ovens, then is baked in extreme heat for two or three days. The baking process converts the coal to coke. The coke is then cooled and loaded onto railroad cars to be used in the manufacturing of locomotives and other iron and steel products. While the railroads are playing the key role in expanding the West, the railroads are also playing a vital role in the Civil War. The Civil War lasts from 1861 until 1865. Over two million Union soldiers and almost one million Confederate soldiers fight in the war. This is the first time railroads play a major role in warfare. Trains move troops, supplies, and heavy artillery. For example, this 13-inch mortar flat car, which weighs nine tons and can shoot a cannonball three miles, moves much more easily and faster pulled by a steam locomotive than pulled by a team of horses. The wood and iron planks in the front of this heavy cannon battery car protect it from incoming shells. This iron-plated monitor car rides in front of the locomotive to protect the engineer, or in the rear to protect the troops on board. Troops inside can fire heavy artillery guns from three sides. This vignette represents the 1863 Battle of the Tennessee Hills. We see a Confederate troop camp, the North and the South battling each other, a wounded soldier in a field hospital, and a log train trying to slip by without getting shot at. During the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln is our president. He has a vision of railroads playing a key role in the future of America when he signs the Pacific Railway Act in 1862. This leads directly to the Golden Spike Ceremony we saw earlier at Promontory Point, Utah in 1869. Sadly, Abraham Lincoln is assassinated on April 15, 1865, and he will never see his dream of a country connected by rail come true. The Lincoln funeral train, with Lincoln's body in a special armor-plated passenger car, leaves Washington, D.C. on April 21, 1865 and heads for Springfield, Illinois, 1,650 miles away. The nine-car train moves slowly through cities, small towns, and rural areas, allowing thousands along the way to pay their respects. The train stops in Michigan City, Indiana on May 1, 1865. They place the special car with Lincoln's body under a 35-foot memorial arch which had been constructed to honor the president. It is decorated with flowers and evergreen boughs. People enter the funeral car, pay their last respects, and leave fresh flowers. This is a sad time for America. The 
Garden Railroad covers a half an acre. There's 3,000 feet of track and nine independent loops. Thomas and James travel the highest loop, which is 14 feet high. 850 tons of Missouri limestone make up the mountains and canyons. There's an 18 foot long metal suspension bridge leading in and out of the Chicago vignette, along with many smaller custom made wood and metal bridges. The state of the art water collection system is amazing. Every drop of water that falls on the garden, walkways, and parking lot drains into a river rock basin underground. The water flows through a sand filter before it is pumped out to the pond. From the pond, it is pumped to the garden where it flows into the streams, tumbles down the waterfall, and waters the ground cover, plants, and trees. The garden is self-sufficient. No outside water is needed. There is a well nearby, but well water is not used because the iron contained in the well water would kill the plants. Right next to the garden is a 2,600 square foot depot building where visitors can refresh and get something to eat. Each of the loops, except for the Thomas Loop, winds its way into the maintenance room, which is located in the depot's lower level. Dave Simkowski is in charge of keeping the trains and vignettes up and running. It's a constant maintenance issue. Every morning we have volunteers that come and clean the track. We have a carbon deposit that builds up on the track. We just wipe it off. Well, we either use ammonia and water or fantastic. Every 16 hours of usage on each locomotive, I bring it into the basement and clean it and oil it. All uh, broken parts are fixed, repaired on as they needed basis. We're doing some major overhauls almost annually on each locomotive. Dave has fun operating the trains with a handheld controller. Each locomotive is given a number and has its own computer chip. Dave sends a signal to the locomotive from his hand controller. The signal tells the locomotive to go or stop go faster or slower, even to ring its bell or blow its whistle. It's all very high tech and it works, most of the time. Wide walkways surround the garden railway and the walls are low so kids can see easily over them. Of all the gardens at the Tall Tree Arboretum, the Garden Railroad has the greatest diversity of plants and trees. There are over 500 varieties and 3,000 individual woody plants in the railway garden. This is only phase one. It covers early steam from 1860 to 1920. Future plans include phase two, which will feature steam locomotives from 1920 to 1950, and phase three, which will cover the diesel era. So eventually, you will be able to see the entire history of railroads in America right here at the Tall Tree Garden Railroad in Valparaiso, Indiana. Even if you don't enjoy trains, you're going to come here and enjoy the plants. You're going to come here and enjoy the waterfalls. You're going to enjoy the architect with the bridges. All summer long, we've had a resident snake that uh, used to bask himself out in one of the bushes. So yes, we do have the frogs, the chipmunks. A couple of months ago, we had hundreds of tadpoles out there. There is something for everybody here. People are amazed all the time at the, the scope and the planning that went into this project. Kids just love it. When we first were designing this, uh, one of the modelers did not want Thomas running up on top of the train because we wanted to keep everything historically accurate and historically believable, but the kids just love the Thomas and series. So we always have one of those uh, running out there. We have a, usually have a circus train out there. And I use the term kids a little freely because it's kids between five years old and 75 years old that come here and enjoy this place. <laughs> Thank you.
hear those car wheels rumbling and rolling through the land. Get on board, little children, get on board. Little children, get on board. Little children, there's room for many a more. I hear the train is coming. She's coming round the curve. She's loosened all the steam and brakes and strain and every nerve. Get on board, little children, get on board. Little children, get on board. Little children, there's room for many a more. Heston Steam Museum in LaPorte, Indiana. Today, Heston's head engineer, Ted Rita, is in the cab of his favorite locomotive, the Shea. The Shea was invented way back in 1880 by a man named Ephraim Shea. 2,771 Shea's were built between 1882 and 1945. Almost 100 are still running, most in tourist railroads like here at the Heston Steam Museum. Shays can climb steep grades, swing around hairpin curves, and haul incredibly heavy loads. They worked in mines carrying ore and in forests carrying big logs from the woods to the sawmill. Shays are different from most steam locomotives. On most steam engines, the fire heats the water in the boiler which creates steam. The steam pressure pushes a piston back and forth in a sideways or horizontal motion. The piston is attached to drive rods which are attached to the drive wheels. The piston powers the drive rods which turn the drive wheels and the locomotive moves. So the power comes from the horizontal or sideways thrusts of the piston. On Shays, the steam pressure powers three pistons that move up and down, or vertically, rather than sideways or horizontally like other steam locomotives. These pistons drive a crankshaft, which drives the wheels through a system of gears, drive shafts, and universal joints. That's way too complicated for me. Let's just say the power on a Shay comes from up and down or vertical motion and on other steam locomotives, the power comes from back and forth, or horizontal motion. Ted Rita loves driving the Shay, and the folks love riding in the open air cars behind the Shay. This number seven Shay was built by Lima Locomotive Works of Lima, Ohio in 1927. It has 12 wheels and 6 axles and weighs 67 tons. It's the biggest locomotive at Heston. Most trains you see today run on standard gauge track. Standard gauge measures 48 and 1 half inches between the rails. The next size is called narrow gauge. 
That's the track Ted is driving the Shay on. It measures 42 inches between the rails. This is the size you usually see at kiddie lands and amusement parks. It's called quarter inch scale and the track measures 12 inches between the rails. The smallest live steam trains at Heston are 1 8 inch scale trains. They run on rails that are only 5 inches apart. Don't let the small size fool you. They may be small, but they can pull a heavy load. As we look at the Shea coming down the track, the boiler is offset to the right of center to balance the cylinders on the left. Shays burn coal, oil, or wood. Shays are easy to work on because the cylinders and running gears are exposed and easy to reach. To keep the Shay running smoothly, Ted oils the gears on his Shay every five miles. The best side to watch a Shay is from the left side because that's where all the action is. You get to see the pistons moving the gears, drive shafts, and wheels and see and hear the steam hissing. The right side of the Shea, called the wrong side by Shea fans, is pretty boring as not much is going on. These are Lionel O-gauge models of the Shea and a locomotive called the Climax. Like the Shea, the Climax works in mines and logging operations. And also like the Shea, she gets her power from the up and down motion of the pistons. where everything goes backwards.
Oh no! This steam locomotive is what most steam locomotives look like. It has a single set of drivers. Those big wheels in the center are called the drivers. The drivers move the locomotive and pull the train. For more pulling power, some bigger locomotives have two sets of drivers. We call these types of locomotives articulated. And this is the 28882 triplex. The triplex is the only locomotive ever built with three sets of drivers. Two sets of drivers are under the locomotive, like on the articulated engines. And the third set is under the tender. And what's even more amazing is the tender has a smokestack. When I was a kid, I called the tender the coal car. It wasn't until I was about 10 that I learned real railroaders call the coal car the tender. The tender's job is to carry the coal that the fireman shovels into the engine's boiler to keep the fire hot to heat the water that creates the steam that powers the driver wheels that makes the locomotive roll down the track. So the triplex tender is the only tender with a set of drive rods, drive wheels, and a smokestack. You might say the triplex needs a tender for its tender. The Virginian Railroad needed a locomotive powerful enough to haul 2,500 tons of loaded rolling stock through tunnels and up steep inclines. Lashing up three steam locomotives could do the job, but it was not easy. Three engineers on three different steam locomotives had to make sure they were all going the same speed. That's when the idea of the triplex was born. A triplex with three sets of drivers could do the work of three separate locomotives and could be run by one engineer. Like many ideas, it looked good on paper, but it didn't work out very well in real life. The triplex was supposed to be able to haul 50, 50 ton coal cars, but that never happened. The triplex had three sets of drivers, but only one boiler, and that boiler couldn't provide enough steam for the big engine to pull that many cars, and it couldn't go over five miles per hour. So the triplex was a flop, but it sure is fun to watch. As I pass the houses and the little toy shacks It's a wonderful kind of feeling It's a feeling I can't explain Why it's a wonderful kind of feeling That's the reason I love toy trains On a rainy day when the sun won't shine I can count on them to make me feel just fine There's always lots of fun coming down the line At the station house and the railway sign it's a wonderful kind of feeling, it's a feeling I can't explain It's a wonderful kind of feeling, that's the reason I love toy trains It's a wonderful kind of feeling, it's a feeling I can't explain It's a wonderful kind of feeling, that's the reason I love toy trains Carnival's coming to town. Let's go!
Well, time to go. Can you believe this? I still have homework. Hope you enjoyed the show. Trains, get them on your mind. <laughs>